Hello, this is Mr. Craig, and today I want to discuss how to write chemical formulas or nomenclature. And what I'm going to talk about in this video is how to write ionic compounds, basic ionic compounds. So, um, here's what I would suggest. If you want to go and look at the sheet that I'm actually working from, click on this link right here from my website, which is www.avon-chemistry.com. This is my general chemistry um, location. So click on that. And from there, click on first semester. That's where we talk about nomenclature. And from this spot here, then you'll scroll down until you see chemical formulas and nomenclature. Where you see chemical formulas and nomenclature, click. All right, on this portion, this is when I used to teach general chemistry, um, here are the different worksheets to help the students understand the concepts of writing chemical formulas. I apologize, the HTML, for whatever reason, put a lot of extra letters in there, but ignore that. I'm going to start off with this one right here, ionic compounds. So if you want to click on that, and you'll see that we have this sheet here where it says chemical compounds. And I'm going to explain how to write these out. And the first half is actually going from the name to the formula, and then on the bottom half it's actually the formula to the name. So let's take a look at that. All right, the first thing that I want to talk about is your periodic table. Hopefully you all have a periodic table and it looks something like this. In other words, you want a periodic table where it doesn't have the names on it. You never want a periodic table with names on it because you need to know the names and the symbols for the elements that you're required to know. Now, depending on who you have as your teacher, there's different requirements. Like for me in AP Chemistry, we only need to know 50 elements, names and symbols. However, some classes I know that need to know 75. Whatever your instructor wants you to do, go ahead and do it. Anything's going to help you. But we want to make sure that it has the symbol and has the charges, at least here. That's what we're going to focus on today are the charges. And I want to explain the periodic table. Some of us may or may not understand the periodic table quite well enough. And I want everybody to realize that there's a division on the periodic table. If your periodic table doesn't have this bold, black, stair-step, case, whatever you want to call that, that separates the metals from the non-metals. And actually, the majority of the elements on the periodic table are metals, where a very small fraction of these are non-metals. But even to clarify that more, if you take a pen or a pencil and put a dot right in the middle of the carbon symbol, another dot right in the middle of the fluorine, and another dot right in the middle of the iodine. And I'll go ahead and do that. So right in the middle of carbon, right in the middle of fluorine, right in the middle of iodine. And once I do that, I'm going to connect those dots and form a nice straight line, actually connecting those. And by doing this, I'm actually helping myself out here rather well. What I've just created, and I hope you can see this on the video, is I've just created what I call the non-metal triangle. In other words, when we talk about naming molecular compounds, in other words, non-metal with non-metal, these are the non-metals that we care about. Notice that I did not include any of the noble gases in there because, for the most part, noble gases don't form too many compounds. Some of these guys like to, but we're not going to talk about that today. So these are the non-metals that we're going to focus on. Anything that's in the triangle or the line is on the triangle, these are the non-metals that we're going to be focused on. These right here are metalloids, so we really don't do a whole lot with that, but the metals are really what we want to focus on with these non-metals in the triangle. All right. Also, let's talk about some basics in naming compounds. Okay. Hopefully you've already discussed this. But when we talk about naming compounds, you always write the metal first, especially if you have an ionic compound. So ionic compounds are composed of a metal with a non-metal. Okay. 
Also, when you have a metal with a non-metal, metals have positive charges. They're positive because metals want to give away their electrons. They are giving them to the non-metals. So non-metals accept those electrons and they'll have a negative charge. Now what's really cool is whenever we write out ionic compounds, we want to make sure that the algebraic sum for these compounds is zero. So if I have a metal that has a plus two charge and say a non-metal with a minus three charge, how in the world am I ever going to get that to equal zero? Well, if you know the charge on one and the charge on the other, we just kind of do a little bit of a cross multiplying type deal. I'm going to put, if I want this all to equal zero and I know I've got a negative three, that means I'm going to need three of these where I'm going to need two of those. Math, basic stuff. So whatever the charge is, that tells me how many I'm going to have. So a little bit of algebra. So two times three minus three times two equals zero. So all these ionic compounds, especially in general chemistry, should equal zero. Okay. The next thing that we need to talk about with ionic compounds is whatever the name of the metal is, we don't change it. Okay. So if you have something like lithium, we don't do anything to that. We leave it as lithium. However, if you have something like, oh, oxygen, okay, we can't call a compound that, is, that has lithium and oxygen, lithium oxygen, okay? There's a special naming for that. Whenever we look at the nonmetal, we want to drop the last syllable or last two syllables and add IDE. So in this case here, back when I was in grade school, this is how we did it. We did oxygen. Some do oxygen. I don't, it doesn't matter how you do it, just realize that in some cases, and again, it takes a little while to, to hear it and to understand it. And the good news is there's not that many non-metals. So once you hear it, hopefully you'll understand it. So in this case here, it's oxygen. We're actually going to get rid of the E-gen and make and add I-D-E. So whenever we look at these, the non-metals, we always add I-D-E to the end, ending after we drop the last syllable or last two syllables. So in this case here, we'll have oxide. So if we were putting this compound together, lithium and oxygen, it's actually a lithium oxide compound. That cool. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these examples. All right. So the sheet that I had from the website there, and let me go ahead and blow that up a little bit here for you. Okay. So we've got our potassium iodide. I'm going to kind of make that a little bigger. The bigger the better, right? All right. So now we can actually see it. Put a little reference mark there so I don't do something dumb. All right. The first one that I want to look at is potassium iodide. Okay. So what we have to do when we're going from the name to the formula is a couple things. First of all, what I said about knowing the names and the symbols is pretty important. So we want to look at our periodic table and we want to find the symbol for potassium. And hopefully we recognize that K is potassium. And the charge, which is in the box here, or if you're not sure about the charge on the box, whatever column it's in. So this wants to have a plus one charge. I think I mentioned it not too long ago. So potassium has a plus one charge. So the best thing that you can do is right above the, the word potassium, write plus one, whatever the charge is. Write its charge above that name. Then for the oxide, I'm sorry, the iodide, we want to come over and find whatever iodide is. Well, it's iodine that has had the I-N-E taken away, and I-D-E has been replaced. And what's the charge on the iodine? Well, let's kind of zoom out a little bit here. Come on here. And if you haven't done this to your periodic table, you should. Well, come on. All right. On your periodic table, when you look at your elements here, okay, anything that's in this column or group 7A, group 7A, okay, are your halogens. I don't know if you need to know that or not, but it's your halogens. So group 7A, all of these non-metals right here are one electron away from having a full octet. In other words, filling up the S and P orbitals. Well, these are one electron away. So what that means is it's looking for a metal to give it one more electron for each of those elements. So everything in this column right here should have a minus one charge. Come on, get in focus.
focus here. So if you haven't done this already, on your periodic table, above that column, write negative 1. Now here's what I want you to notice. If you look at, say, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, they have multiple charges. Don't use those. Not until much, much later on. Don't use those charges. The only charge we care about right now is the negative 1 charge. In other words, if you're looking at an ionic compound that has a single kind of metal or a single kind of nonmetal, each one of these, when it's hooked up with a metal, will have a negative 1 charge. Okay? These charges are only used when we look at the polytonics, and you're not doing that yet. Okay? So don't do that yet. Looking at the group 6A, or the second column here, it's 2OA. It, has two more, it needs two more electrons that have the same electron configuration as neon. So all the nonmetals in group 6A have a negative 2 charge. So the nonmetals, the oxygen, the sulfur, and the selenium, notice inside the nonmetal triangle, that's the only ones we care about, these will have a negative 2 charge. And you'll notice it does have negative 2, but it also has more than one charge. Ignore those other charges. Negative 2 is the one that we want to focus on. Okay? And then the last column that we care about is group 5A. And they are 3 away from having an octet. So we, all of those elements there, have, it, have a negative 3 charge. Okay? Now, arsenic, eh, it's a little tricky. I don't really do a whole lot with arsenic because it's such... Don't do anything with it. It doesn't... Even though it's barely on the uh, triangle, and I think I may have messed up by not drawing that straight line, I don't consider arsenic in this mix of nonmetals. So for the nitrogen and phosphorus, those will have only a negative 3 charge. Ignore these other charges whenever you're writing ionic compounds. Ignore them. The only charges we care about are negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. Period. Understand? Don't be tempted by these other charges. They're going to get you in trouble. All right, so knowing that the iodine, which is located here, is in group 7A, has a negative 1 charge, we're going to write right above the iodide, negative 1. So now we know what our charges are. We've got a potassium with a plus 1, an iodide with a negative 1. You know what? That's awesome because that equals 0. Now, if you really want to do this right, whatever the charges are for these, that's how many of the opposite we're going to have. But do realize with ionic compounds, we always want the smallest whole number ratio. So when we look at that, if I have a plus one charge on my potassium, that means I need one iodine. If I have a negative one charge on the iodine, that means I need one potassium. The value that I have in the parentheses is my subscript when I write out this formula. So potassium iodide has one potassium and one iodine. Now, we never ever write subscripts for one. If you have at least one letter here, it's implied that you have at least one. The only time that we ever write a subscript is when we need to represent more than one. Okay? All right, let's take a look at the next one. Magnesium chloride. Okay, so on your periodic table, find where magnesium is located. And it's very conveniently located in group 2A. And again, everything in group 2A has a plus 2 charge. So what we want to do above the magnesium is write a plus 2 charge. And then the chloride is actually chlorine with the IDE taken out. And since chlorine is also in group 7, it has a negative 1 charge for each chlorine. So we write a negative 1 charge there and then equals 0. Well, when we look at negative 1 and plus 2, we have to make sure that the algebra works out. So we'll do whatever the charge is, that's how many of the opposite we're going to have. So since we have chloride with a negative 1, that means we have 1 magnesium. Since magnesium has a plus 2 charge, that means we need 2 chlorines. It's algebra. So 2 times 1 minus 1 times 2 equals 0. So whatever values we have in the parentheses, that's our subscript. Again, don't write the subscript 1. So over here, we'll have... Magnesium with one representative, and chloride or chlorine with two. Okay. All right. Isn't that fun? All right, looking at number three, calcium nitride. Let's find calcium. And again, on your periodic table, uh, calcium is located over here in group 2A. So calcium has a plus two charge. 
So we'll put a plus two right above the calcium. Nitride, again, nitride, nitrogen, the O-gen is taken out. We're putting in the IBE. So this is nitride is nitrogen. So on your periodic table, find where nitrogen is. Well, it's in group 5A, and it has a negative 3 charge because it's 3 away from having the octet. So we'll put our charge for the nitrogen as negative 3. And again, the algebra has to equal 0. So whatever the charge is, that's how many we're going to have. So we're going to have 2 nitrogens and 3 calciums. Cross multiply on this one. So we'll put a 3 there and a 2 there. So these are our subscripts. Finally, we have values that are, there's no ones there. So calcium is CA. Since I have a sub or a three in there, that's my subscript. The nitride is N, and it has a subscript of two. So calcium nitride, boom, there it is. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Aluminum iodide. So find aluminum. Now aluminum is way over on the other side in group 3A. So again, everything in group 3A has a plus 3 charge. So aluminum has a plus 3 charge. So we'll put a plus 3 above that. And then the iodide, which we just worked with not too long ago. Iodine is right here, which is in group 7A. Notice how I'm using the periodic table. You've got to use the periodic table when doing this. So iodine, for each iodine, has a negative one charge. So put a negative one there, and we want it to equal zero. So that means we're going to need one aluminum and three iodines. So a one there and a three there. So aluminum, Al, and that'll have a subscript of one, whatever's in our parentheses. And the, what is that, iodine is an I. And make sure... Yeah, be very careful when you're doing this that you just don't make your eyes look like an L. Okay, so really make it a, a capital I. So in this case, I need three of those. So there's aluminum iodide because I need three of those because the aluminum has a plus three charge. And again, this is based on making sure the algebraic sum for our charges equals zero. Because when we look at a metal, the non-metal, the mechanism is that in this case here, aluminum has three valence electrons. So that means that aluminum is giving one electron to each of the iodines. That's why we need three of those. And then they're hooked up and everybody's happy. So metals want to lose their electrons to have zero valence electrons. Non-metals want to have eight. Okay. So if you remember that rule, life is going to be great. All right. Try the next one on your own, barium fluoride. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and work it out. Go ahead and pause the video if you'd like so you can try this. Did you get barium fluoride is BAF2? Good. Try the next one, magnesium oxide. And yes, it is a one-to-one, -one, ratio-wise. Calcium chloride. It's plus two because it's in group 2A. And chlorine.
Okay? Isn't that easy? All right, now for the fun stuff. Let's look at the, the symbols. Okay? I actually prefer the symbols a lot better than... Let's blow that up a little bit. Scoot you over. Okay. I actually like the symbols a little better because it's a little more fun. Um, the reason why I say is, say that is because now you have to know what that represents for. So a lot of you will say, oh yeah, calcium, psh, I know what the symbol is for that. But here it's like, Ugh, what is that? And now you have to be a little more careful about what you're looking at and where metals be where metals end and where non-metals begin, okay? So that's what you want to know your, your elements, names, and symbols. All right, so looking at the first one, we've got Zn and then I. Well, let's do this first. If we look on our periodic table, there's zinc. It's actually, oh, I'm sorry, Zn, which has a plus two charge. And the nice thing about this transition metal, it only has a single charge. Most of the other transition metals have more than one charge, We'll talk about those multiple charges in a different video. So we know that zinc has a plus two, so let's do the same thing. Put a two above it. And how many zincs do I have listed or represented here? Well, since there's no subscript, it's safe to say that there's a one there. And then looking at the iodine, well, we want to find out what the charge on the iodine is. Well, it's here, so it has a negative one charge since it's in group 7A. So just to check it, we know that that's written correctly, but honestly, you don't need to do all of that unless you're just dying to find out. Now, in a later video, we very well may want to find out what the charges are, okay? But actually, we don't need to because if it's written out like this, I hope that whoever gave you this has it written out correctly. So now let's just write it, okay? So when you look at zinc, Zn, that represents zinc. So all you have to do is write zinc. And what does the I represent again? Iodine. But we don't want to write iodine. We want to drop the I-N-E and add ide. So it's iodide. Okay. And then looking at the next example, we don't need to worry about the charges because they're balanced out. What is Ca? That's right. It's calcium. So we have... Whoops. Right, so big. So I have calcium, okay, and then it's with Br. What is Br? That's bromine, so calcium bromide. So drop the INE and the bromine and add IDE, so bromide. Now, the nice thing is we don't have to worry about the charges with these because they are balanced out. All right, NAF, what is Na? That's right, it's sodium. And the F is fluorine, but drop the E and put ide, so fluoride. That's the stuff that's in your toothpaste, sodium fluoride, okay, if you brush your teeth. All right, ALCL3. Again, don't worry about how many we have, we just worry about the name. That's the beautiful thing about ionic compounds. We don't have to worry about how many we have unless we're writing the names up top, or we're going from the names to the formula. So here it's just aluminum chloride, strontium chloride, lithium oxide. So again, on the oxygen, drop the last two syllables, add IDE. Number seven is potassium iodide, sodium iodide. Oops, went too far. Barium, Cl2. Let's actually blow that up a little bit. Okay. BaCl2, barium chloride. What's A G? That's right. Remember, it's not gold. There's no G in gold. That's silver. Okay, A G is silver. No G in gold. Okay, so silver, iodide, zinc, oxide, magnesium, iodide, aluminum, oxide, and lithium, bromide. Okay, so this is how to write easy ionic compounds. In other words, you have two, you have one metal and one kind of non-metal, all right? 
So this is ionic compounds. Hope this video has helped.